So good afternoon everybody. Today we're looking at finance, macroeconomics and uh, the interaction of liquidity and solvency. This is kind of not something that you would have seen um, in, a traditional, uh, in a traditional macroeconomics class or economics or business class even up to say three or four years ago. But now it's mandatory that we show it to you. It's actually really important. Um, and the reason is that finance and macroeconomics obviously interact with one another. And the reason that they interact crucially is because the size of the financial indus industry, excuse me, uh, in particular in Ireland, is so large that it, it actually can destabilize the macroeconomy as a whole. And it's very important, and we know this because we've studied the ISLM model, that when the financial system is, is not working, when it is misfiring, what that means for the economy is a contraction of credit. So that's the first thing. I love this quote. This guy Chuck Prince, he was the, he was the former CEO of Citigroup, which is now Citibank. Um, in the Financial Times in 2007, he said, when the music stops in terms of liquidity, things will get complicated. But as long as the music is playing, you got to get up and dance, and we're still dancing, okay? So I, I'm really actually quite interested in this. He was fired for these comments, actually. He lost his job because of these comments. It's really interesting, as a matter of fact. Um, his point is that when there's really cheap money, it makes a lot of sense to just keep trading with one another. You know, you keep dancing, you keep the music going, but actually, he knew in 2007 that there's something wrong. This is one of the most powerful bankers in the world saying, yeah, lads, I think there's, there's a serious concern. Yeah. So he lost his job for this, for pointing this out. It's quite, quite a serious point. So last time we looked at finance and arbitrage in markets. And this time we're going to look at the interaction of finance and the economy. OK? This is important. Um, would you please write this down? This is what I want you to learn. You can switch off or leave if you want to have a chat or whatever about it, okay? Um, write this down, get this into your heads, and we're done. The positive and negative interaction of leverage, liquidity, and solvency determines the macroeconomy. This is very important. It determines the level of economic activity. If you get this, you get the point of the lecture. So this is what I really want you to know today. There is a positive and negative feedback. I'm going to show you some data on this later on. But there's a negative interaction of leverage, liquidity, and solvency. We must define these three terms very carefully with the macroeconomy, which is just the sum of consumption, investment, government expenditure, and so on and so forth. These positive and negative interactions are what generate business cycles. They generate asset bubbles. Those asset bubbles and their destruction are what you guys have to live through. Okay, so first things first, uh, recall these important identities. First, Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Savings, S, is equal to investment, I, in equilibrium. And government spending, G, is equal to taxes, T, in equilibrium. But the important point that I'd like you all to note is that we are never actually in equilibrium. Meaning the saving does not equal investment in a given point in time. And very importantly for us in Ireland, government spending does not equal taxes. As a matter of fact, government spending is much, much larger in, than taxes, which is what is necessitating a 3.5 billion euro correction this year, which is freaking many, many people out. There was a survey done recently by the Irish uh, Credit Union um, uh, body that showed that 96% of the country though 96% of the respondents are actually really worried about their incomes following the budget. Like that's, that's, a, that's an enormous source of uncertainty in the economy. Okay? Very important, just recall these, no need to write them down, but remember folks, we are never in equilibrium. So, first remember this. When you see this, y is equal to c plus i, really what you should be looking at is y is equal to c plus i minus s plus G minus T, plus X minus M. The reason that you're going to look, at, look like that is because there's imbalances here. There's an imbalance here and an imbalance here. And obviously this is always an imbalance. 
we quite like this imbalance actually. So it's an important point that you should remember. There are three balances, if you like, in the economy. We'll study that next week. Incidentally, I, I, I'm sure, I hope you all know anyway, that there is no lecture uh, next Monday. We have a bank holiday. You can come in. <laughs> you can come in, but I won't be here. Uh, uh, and no, no one else will. So feel free to come in and sort of sit here and dream the dream that would have been had we been here. But no, there is no lecture next week. Okay, we're never in equilibrium. So, <clears throat> first, write down the first sentence of, of this, please. What is leverage? Leverage is the use of debt financing to fund activities. It's the use of debt financing to fund activities. Or you can think about it as the number of assets that are also controlled by equity. Okay? So your, 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 your leverage, in a certain sense, is how much you're borrowed relative to how much you have. So if you, if you have a, an income of 20,000 euros a year, but you borrowed 100,000 euros, your leverage ratio is 5 to 1. Okay? So you, you see what I mean? Um, it's a use of debt financing. So remember, remember we had several sources of financing uh, in firms when we looked at it in week three. Yeah? We'd, we'd, we had firms could finance themselves out of retained earnings. Do you remember that model? Firms could finance themselves out of retained earnings. They could finance themselves out of, um, out of uh, profits, or, uh, and they could also finance themselves out of uh, debt. So banks, in particular, a bank is highly leveraged. If its loans, the value of its loans are much greater than the value of its deposits. So if the, if the firm has 100 euros of deposits and it's allowed to lend out 98 of them, then ideally it should have 98 euros worth of loans. But of course, if there's massive demand for loans and the firm and the bank can get money from other banks abroad, then it can lend out more money and get more money, get, get, get more profits. And that's exactly what happened in Ireland. Now, leverage is always affected by collateral levels at points in time. These collateral levels are, you know, how much is okay to borrow? So it was okay to borrow 105% for a mortgage in 2007. If you went into a bank now and said, hi, how's it going? Are you well? My name's Stephen, I'd like a 105% mortgage. They wouldn't even give you a meeting with the bank manager, they'd just laugh at you. Now the highest you can get, I think, is 90% or 92% loan to value. Really, which is, and even that's pretty excessive. In Germany, uh, and in particular in Denmark, um, you know, you'd, be very, you'd be very lucky to get an 80% loan to value mortgage. So leverage is affected by these collateral levels and it allows a bank to increase the potential gains, and this is also important, the potential losses on a position or investment beyond what would be possible through a direct investment or its own funds. So would you all please write this down? Leverage amplifies gains and losses. This is very important. It amplifies gains and losses. If you have a situation where you invest, you bet a euro, and the thing comes in at 10 to 1, the maximum you can win is, is 11 quid, right? 10 or plus 1, you get it back. If you bet 100 grand, okay, and it, it comes in at 10 to 1, obviously you make more money, and you feel a lot better, right? But if you've just borrowed the tenor from somebody, and if you borrow the 100 grand from somebody, clearly your losses are amplified, as well as your gains. So this is an important point to make. Leverage equals instability. Okay? So here's an example of what I mean. Here's a, a, a bank or a house or whatever, okay? It, is, it has assets of 2,000 and liability to 2,000. No need to take it down, it's all available on the web already. Here's the, here, it's two loans, loan A for a grand, loan B for 500, it's 300 in cash and 200 in capital, okay? It has a checking account, 500, so it creates a loan and puts it into a checking account, and here it creates a loan and puts it into a checking account, and it has 500 euros worth of equity. Its equity is 500 and its assets are 2,000. Its leverage is just its assets divided by its equity, which is four to one. So that's fine and pretty boring. But what happens if loans go bad? Well, th well, this is what happens, okay? Now the value of your assets collapses. This loan stays the same, but this loan drops from 1,000 to 400. 60% drop. What, what does this look like? 
Well, this is, this is the banking crisis in Ireland, okay? You still have your cash, you still have your capital, okay? This is still the same. The only difference is now that the, you've already lent the amount, okay? You, the, the amount is in your bank account. This is, either you've spent this thousand buying a house or something, uh, or it's still sitting there. Whatever, you have the loan, the, the, the loan is, is worth a lot less than what you've got. And so you have this, equity of 500, but now your assets are 1400. Your leverage has collapsed. Is this bank solvent? Is it in negative equity? Hands up here who thinks this bank is solvent? Does this bank have a liquidity problem or a solvency problem? I haven't defined either of those terms yet, but I think we need to understand this, okay? Liquidity and solvency are the two key core concerns that have gotten Ireland really into the problem that it's in right now. In September 2008, the bankers showed up at the Ministry of Finance, and, and sorry, the Department of the Taoiseach, and they said, listen, we have a problem. The problem is a liquidity problem. If you don't give us money and guarantee the banks right now, there's going to be a run on the currency, there's going to be a queue outside the banks, <coughs> The country will break down. You have to do something. They, the policymakers, Brian Lennon and uh, Brian Cowan, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance at the time, were misled and deliberately lied to by the bankers, who told them that this is a liquidity problem which you can solve. There is never, ever, ever a problem with liquidity. If you are a government, you never have problems with liquidity. You could always supply more cash. If you are a government and the bank is insolvent, if it is a solvency problem, you are absolutely, categorically, and I use this in the technical sense, fucked. You are really, really in trouble. The reason you're in trouble if it's insolvent is because throwing money into it implies that you're gonna to have to keep throwing money into it. They become black holes. So now, you are solvent if in a given moment, a country or a firm or a business or a person can, has enough assets to cover, cover the claims from its liabilities. That's what solvency means, okay? You're solvent if you can cover any claims, roughly speaking. Now, there are different, there are different accounting definitions of solvency, but if you understand this, you'll understand everything else about it. Basically, if somebody comes to you as a bank and says, hi, I'd like my thousand euros back, and you can give it to them, you're solvent. You can do it. The value of your assets is greater than the value of your liabilities. It's all good in the hood. Fine. Okay? Now, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, had a lot to say about this. Because in the 1930s, there were failing banks. And he had seen a series of them. A little-known American economist called Hyman Minsky wrote a book in 1986 called Stabilizing an Unstable Economy, where he talked about the interaction of insolvent institutions with the government. And finally, George Soros, um, a billionaire who's worth about 14 billion euros himself. Um, he has written a, a, a large amount about banking crises and particularly about the uh, interaction of markets with the economy. So that's solvency. Now liquidity is a much more complex idea. Think about liquidity as the ability to meet short-term <coughs> obligations. Okay, so you're liquid if somebody comes to you and says, hi, can I have a, that 100 euros you owe me back? You can give it back to so in that sense, it's almost, almost equivalent to solvency. However, liquidity is also higher given a higher level of trading activity. If more people are buying and selling houses, the housing market is liquid because you can get a true price. And you can see that a market is liquid when you can buy and sell the assets. And that pushes the buy price and the sell price around. Yeah. So you can, you, what you see if effectively in a liquid market, you see very small spreads. You see, I wanted to sell my house for 100 grand and I sold it for 105, so the spread is five. Or I wanted to sell my house for 100 grand and I got 95, you know? Now, we don't see that. You want to sell your house for 400,000 and a man comes along with 150 and you go, yeah, please take it, thanks, that'll be great. The spread is enormous, yeah? Because there isn't a fully liquid market. The seller is beholden to the buyer in that situation, in the housing market in Ireland right now, if you have 150 grand in cash, you could buy an amazing gaff. Yeah? So, um, <clears throat> markets that seize, like our housing market, are not liquid really in any sense. Um, 
Now, it is also the case, and it's a further complication, and I'm sorry to complicate it, but the world is a complicated place. I, I'm not sugarcoating it for you. That liabilities can be also used as liquidity engines. And one example of this is the NAMA project. It, is, it basically acquired the liabilities and the assets of a huge, huge series of portfolio, uh, or, or property portfolios. And what it's doing and what it's trying to do, and it's, its explicit intention, is to restart the housing market by injecting liquidity into the system, by, by using these liabilities. Okay? Now, liquidity, leverage, and solvency interact with one another because they're obviously balance sheet phenomena. Um, <clears throat> to understand these phenomena, I'd like to teach you Soros's theory of reflexivity. Okay. Soros is he's a great example of a guy, and, and you often get this with economists. Um, somebody says, well, if you're so smart, if you know so much about the economy, why aren't you rich? You know, why are you, like, why are you earning like 50 grand a year chatting to undergraduates? Why aren't you like a millionaire if you know so much about this? You know, uh, and Soros is one of these people who quite literally put his money where his mouth is. He's now worth probably more than the national debt of Ireland. His, he, his personal wealth is in the tens of billions. Um, so here's his argument. And by the way, he, he's, he said, this is how I invest. This is how I invest. He's, he's made no secret of the fact that he said, this is what I do. And people go, oh, yes, but there must be some trick. And he goes, no, there's no trick. This is how I do it. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And they go, no, this is how I do it. Here's his argument. You and me and everybody have an imperfect understanding of the world. You exercise your brain, your cognitive function, to understand the world. You understand the space in which we're sitting, standing right now. You understand what we're doing here. You understand the social context, the economic concept, context, all of that. You want to understand the world. You want to understand it. However, you participate within the world. And when you participate, you change the world. And I don't mean in that sort of, change the world, you know, we are the children kind of shit. No, what I actually mean is, you know, I believe the children are our future. No, what I mean is, you want to buy a house. You look at the housing market, yeah, and you buy the house. By buying the house, you've changed the market. You've added information into the system. Oh, Kinsella bought that house for 200,000. So the market sees something. You've taken a house off the supply of houses, and you've also borrowed money, which has changed the bank. Do you see what I mean? You changed the world, literally. The world existed before you bought the house, and then you changed it by buying the house. By participating in the world, you change it. <clears throat> now, these two functions interfere with one another, because if, if, if you need to participate in the world, you have to act. You have to buy the house. You have to not buy the house. Those are two, those are two participations. <clears throat> if you don't buy the house, you've got to rent something or live with your parents or something, right? <clears throat> so you must act today based on your facts from yesterday and your beliefs about tomorrow. And whatever we please write that down. That's very important. You must act, okay? And even a negative action in, in this sense is an action. The, the act of not buying the house also changes the world. Do you see what I'm saying? It also changes the world. And there are feedback loops between these two functions. The feedback loop is, 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 um, is pretty severe, actually. So think about it. The world is telling me houses are really overpriced. Don't buy them. So I don't buy them. And because I don't buy them, people see that nobody's buying houses and the price of houses drop. Yeah? There's an interaction between people's cognitive function and the participation function that they have to hold. Now, there's a great book. Uh, Soros's book is called The New Paradigm for Financial Markets. It's well worth buying. I, 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 I generally don't have this on the list. If you're interested enough about this stuff, just get the book. I, I don't think it's expensive. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from it. I've read all his books, and I'm very impressed with the guy, to be honest. So. Soros is a third concept, and it calls it reflexivity. The concept of reflexivity says a reflexive situation happens when there's a lack of correspondence between participants' views and the actual state of affairs. Okay? So 
In 2007, economists were going on the radio and the television saying there's going to be a soft landing, it's going to be grand. Meanwhile, the economy was hurtling into the ground. So there was a massive lack of correspondence between what the economists perceived as reality and the actual state of affairs. Similarly, similarly, right now, it's pretty clear that the hospital consultants have not really connected fully with reality. Uh, if you read the Irish Times today, you'll see that. Um, it's quite interesting. So, this is a reflective situation. Now, the further the distance is, the more likely there is going to be a crisis. That's important. That's important. So, think if we go back to, I made the point about the, this liquidity versus solvency problem. The participants' views in the Department of the Taoiseach on the night of September 29th, 2008, was that it was a liquidity problem. However, the actual state of affairs was it was a solvency problem. The difference between the two caused the crisis. Okay? So, for example, you're buying and selling stock in anticipation of future prices, but of course those prices are contingent on investors' expectations. People play a game at the moment, and it's called buy Apple, sell Apple. Yeah. So you, what a lot of people are doing is they're selling Apple, right? Selling Apple, Apple, Apple Core's share, shares, right? They're like 500 euros a share, and what they're doing is they're selling them off right before an earnings announcement. So Apple's earning, earnings announcements are coming now, right? So if you think Apple is making lots and lots of money, they sold like five million iPhones or something in a minute and a half. So, so you think that their earnings are gonna go up, which means that after the earnings announcement, people are gonna wanna buy this, which means that they, they're, they're gonna wanna buy it in advance of the earnings announcement. So you should sell, if you have the Apple stock, you should sell it before the earnings announcement to capitalize on the increased belief that people have that these earnings are going to be great. So does everybody get that? You're anticipating other people's anticipation. It's kind of game theoretic. Now, very importantly, expectations do not qualify as knowledge. The fact that I expect to live to be 100 is not knowledge. It doesn't, like, you know, I can't say, well, obviously, I'm planning, you know, he, these are the shoes I'll wear when I'm 97. Like, that's not knowledge. Your knowledge is only of the past. You have beliefs about the future. Incidentally, um, and if any of you ever thought Twitter was useless, this is probably going to confirm your, your uh, suggestions. Any of you that have seen Back to the Future 2, have you seen that film? Barney McFly? This is the week that he came to in the future. Isn't that really shit? He had like hoverboards and robots and blow up jackets. This is the year. What have we got? Twitter. You know? Dropping some dude out of a, out of a, out of a shuttle to um, sell fizzy drinks. Anyway, these expectations do not qualify as knowledge. I want my jetpack. I want my jetpack. Why don't I have one? Markets, okay, markets are not self-correcting because of this element. So here's the idea. There is a prevailing bias at any moment which the market mistakes as fundamentals. So this prevailing bias is Apple can do no wrong, or um, house prices will always go up, or Ireland is, is going to default. There's a prevailing bias. Investors' perceptions actually change the fundamentals. So five years ago, we were the best in the class. Now we're the worst. The investors' perceptions are what changes these things, which is why the Moody's and the rating agencies like Moody's matter so much, because they change investors' perceptions. The transition between agreements on these, trans, on these fundamentals cause crises, and leverage is the result. So I'm showing you here asset prices divided by earnings on the y-axis, and on the x-axis you're looking at time. What you see is sort of a little bubble here. And the reason I've drawn it like this is because there is a little bubble, and it justifies everybody's expectations. And then it goes down a little bit, and people go, oh, this is a great time to buy. Brilliant, brilliant. Look, a head and shoulders effect. Happy days which I showed you before, and then it goes Pow! Asset prices divided by earnings for, this, let's say, the shares, they explode, and then they drop back down. Best example of this, the dot-com bubble, when any idiot with a website was able to become a millionaire. Yeah. So, leverage is the result. And the leverage looks like this, this blue line. Leverage, and this is important, 
only goes up, really up, as the cycle begins to drop. Yeah? So the people, in, think about it in, in, in the Irish context, the people who are really, really, really in trouble right now are the people who bought in like 2006, 2007, 2008. As the market was actually transitioning downward in terms of sales, people were buying these houses in 2006, 7, and 8, and they were the ones racking up all the leverage. Okay? So it's an important point to make. Again, no need to write all this down at all. On the web. So the share price starts to rise. Here's, here's the, the, the story, if you like. Share price starts to rise. The upward price bias reinforces this trend, this idea, oh yeah, things are gonna be great, it's all gonna work out. The earnings per share rise, but it lags the asset price. So people go, oh, Apple, they're making new iPads, whatever, and people go, brilliant, brilliant, that's great. The asset price rises, and then earnings per share rise. Eventually, there's a collapse. Now, importantly, and this is not something that people realize a lot, the upswing lasts longer than the decline. So in net terms, the economy is actually better off. It doesn't feel like it, but the upswing generally lasts longer than the decline, which is cool. And it is this, this is Soros' theory, the, this interaction of asset prices with leverage. So here's some real world data. This is from the IMF. All the next couple of slides are from the IMF. Here's what happened in Ireland, okay? So this, this black line is the savings rate. It's actually the gross savings rate in Ireland, okay? So you can see that the savings rate was actually negative in 2003. Meaning, not only were we not saving anything, we're actually we were, we were borrowing so much that it was kind of getting a bit ridiculous. You can see that we're, what was happening here, these red lines show liabilities. These are transactions. This is, this is for the entire Ireland of Ireland, right? Um, here are financial assets transactions. So you can see it, it goes up a little bit, but not too much. Here you see investment, gross capital formation. You can, that red, you can, you can just assume that yellow line is building houses, yeah? You can see that it, it's exploding quarterly, and look at its contraction now. Basically, you're talking about outhouses finishing off projects now, yeah? Look at the liabilities transaction. They're up here now. There's been a complete swing up. So what's happened is people are basically went from saving nothing to saving an awful lot. Savings rate has exploded in Ireland. Okay? Exactly as investment has stopped. So do you remember I was showing at the very start of this lecture, I minus S, yeah? That yellow line, that's I. That's I, and this is S. And can you see the imbalance? It's right there. It's right there. So here's what happened to the components of GDP, which is why I got you to remember that stuff, Y is equal to C plus I plus G. The black line is consumption. You can see the bubble, can't you? You can see the bubble in every, in, 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 literally you see it in each thing. The black line is consumption in billions of euros. The blue line is disposable income. Look what's happened to disposable income. It's collapsed. Here's net borrowing. So it's a credit fuel boom and then splat. So relate that back to the slides about the leverage cycle. Okay? Relate that back. Consumption has collapsed. Investment absolutely collapsed. Net wealth. Look at net wealth. This is net wealth at the peak of the boom was like 90 billion euros. Now net wealth, 65. 25 billion euros was knocked off the net wealth of the, of the state. That's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And not only was this wealth destroyed, there's a good question as to whether it ever existed in the first place, you know? And if you're paying kind of, you know, 700 grand for a two-bedroom department with stunning views, you know, I, I, I've decided, I've decided that, that I, 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 I've got to create a new index. I'm going to call it the hubris index. And it's, you know, sort of two skinny blonde women staring at windows going, stunning, stunning. Fiacre, isn't it stunning? It is stunning. The more people you see on shows like that property porn stuff, stunning. Yes, it's a good example. It's, a great, it's, it's, good, it's going to be a good index, I think, um, for the future. Uh, I, I, really do, I really do think that, actually. 
the more of that sort of cultural stuff uh, that we see going on. Stunning. Anyway, this is the biggest problem. This is the ratio of household debt to disposable income. And what you see is Ireland, at one stage, had a, had a ratio of household debt to disposable income of about 220%. Which is, I mean, when you think about it relative to, say, uh, Spain, here's Spain. Spain is 150, and they're considered a basket case, yeah? Uh, the UK is up here. They, by the way, some, some news in the UK, they just started growing again. Their GDP went up by 1% in the last quarter, which is kind of good news. Um, this, this, uh, this is the USA here, household, disposable, household debt to disposable income. So now, with, why, why this ratio actually matters, by the way, why this ratio matters is because your disposable income is what you have after you've paid your rent and, or your mortgage and your car loan and all that. If you've got, I don't know, let's say a grand at the end of the month, and you are highly indebted, you're going to pay off that loan more quickly. So this being that high means after all your bills, you've got a euro left. You owe two euros and ten cent. Yeah? That's a disaster because it means you really can't pay it off that quickly. So it also means that debt is the biggest problem in Ireland right now. You know? Nice. Stunning. Dollars. Okay, why are the dollars? Okay, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, feedbacks matter. I like this chart. Don't take it down. But I really like this. This is how the IMF think about Ireland. Okay. So what? Let's just take it from 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 the left to the right. Okay. From yeah, from your your left. Okay. So here is the rest of the world: exports and imports. Here we have consumption, investment. Demand. Here's how exports lead to disposable income, which leads to increased demand, which leads to, to import. Okay? This is the real economy, basically the IS curve. Okay? Here we have disposable income, and that either goes into consumption, investment, or amortization, i.e., paying down loans. Um, and this goes to the rest of the world as outflows, or it can come back in as inflows. This is how lending happens. So this is the banking sector. Okay? If the households are investing, then it leads to increases in asset prices, which change collateral values, which increase lending, which increase consumption. Can you see the chain, the causal chain? I think, despite the hideous graphic, this is something that you should all be very, very aware of. It's a bit like the circular flow model that I showed you in week uh, three, I think, or week four. Except what it's telling you is how the, the IMF thinks the Irish economy functions. And I, I think it's kind of cool. In fact, I think it's very cool. I, I think the fact that they set this out, this is their mental model for Ireland. And I, I, I think this is really cool. I think it's well worth you, if you just sit down with this, Okay, and get out a, a blank sheet of paper and just draw the boxes yourself and just connect the dots yourself. You'll have a really good sense of what's going on in the Irish economy. Bonus marks, by the way, if you put numbers beside all those things. So for the last quarter in Ireland, if you go to the CSO website and just get the value of consumption, get the value of investment, the value of the asset prices, and just try your best to fill in this balance sheet, that would be very, very interesting. Okay, so very cool, isn't it? I think. Anyway, last last chart: household borrowing and saving. What do you see here? This is from 2003 to the last quarter of 2012. What you're seeing here is this blue line shows you GDP growth. You can see it's positive. It's seasonal, of course, but it's positive, and then kaboom, it collapses, and then it's it's back up to kind of zero percent here now. This is net borrowing. Households were net borrowers. In other words, if you had 10 households, five of them, seven of them were borrowing and, and three of them were saving. So the household was actually a net borrower. But look now, now it's actually a net lender because the houses, households aren't spending. They aren't spending, so that means they're giving money into the system. Okay? Here's capital formation. 
basically investment. And here's saving. So what do you have? What is this telling you? It's telling you that there's a disjuncture between investment and saving in the economy. And where is this disjuncture coming from? It's coming from the complete collapse in certainty that the Irish households have. It's coming because they're already highly indebted. But most importantly, it's coming because the banks themselves are damaged. They're financial intermediaries that aren't actually doing any financial intermediation. So, we won't look at all this, but I just want to give you a sense of it. Keynes, in his treatise on money, had this idea. It was a nice idea, actually. He, he had this financial cycle. He, he assumed there were two types of people, bears and bulls. You know? Bears always want to hold cash because they think the economy is going to go flat in any minute. And bulls want to hold securities because they want return. They're risk lovers. Yeah? If you have a bull market where the asset prices always rise, then the bears close out their positions and they're in good shape. So you see the asset price goes up, the amount of money in the system drops, and the amount of short positions drop, and the leverage level drops, which is cool. In a bear market, you have some people who think the economy's in bits and other people think it's gonna go okay. The bears increase their positions on the rising market, they buy more risky stuff, they buy more assets. What does that mean? It means that the money supply rises with the rising market. Asset prices going up, money supply going up, and people taking more short positions. However, if there's a bear market and then there's a division of opinion, now link this back to Soros. Soros says it's all about the disjuncture between people's perceptions of fundamentals and what's actually out there. Yeah? This is Keynes and Soros kind of agreeing with each other. That's the connection that I'm trying to show you here. The security prices fall, M3 falls, which is the money supply, um, and the bears close out the positions really quickly, meaning that leverage collapses, okay? Then finally, it moves back. There's a bear market with a consensus of opinion. <coughs> Security prices fall insufficiently, and the bears increase the positions on the falling market. This is Keynes's cycle. And it looks a bit like this, okay? So, position one, here's the bear position. My thing. Here's the bear position, or the amount of leverage. Here's the asset price. So initially, the leverage level is actually falling along with the asset price, and then it increases. And then there's this weird moment, I'm oh, sorry, then, then, then there's this kind of long, long, long lead up as asset prices increase and the bears build up their leverage. And then suddenly there's a flip where everybody goes, oh my God, we're, wait, the Irish economy? Oh my God, it's in bits, quick. And it deleverages, so people get rid of all the debt they have. That's where we are right now. We're in position three, okay? That's where we are right now, folks. We're in position three, which is a bit of a disaster because th this is the type of position that can last an awfully long time. Morgan Kelly's uh, 2007 quarterly economic commentary showed that the average length of most property bubble collapses is about um, five to, sorry, seven to 14 years, which would mean if the, if the, if the economy can be dated as, as having collapsed in the fourth quarter of 2007 means that we have roughly seven more years to go until this thing comes back. Now, there is a last slide here, which is about leverage and contagion. And we're gonna be talking about this next Thursday. Imagine you have two banking sectors with four banks. I'm gonna leave you on this. Two banking sectors with four banks, okay? Bank A is over leveraged. It gets into trouble. It's a French bank. What happens to banks B, C, and D? You've got two countries. The banks are interconnected with one another. Okay? They're all lending, but look at the cycle. Bank A lends to bank C. Bank D lends to C and B. And bank B just links to bank A. So, so when you think about this, they're, they're kind of fairly well connected to one another. There's a nice cycle. But this guy's about to go bang. What happens to bank C? Text in if you know the answer. So this guy's really over levered and something goes wrong. Maybe, maybe bank A is like Anglo or um, Irish Nationwide or something. Okay, or maybe one of the Spanish Cajas banks. Cajas, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But what happens to these guys? Pardon? Yes, the, that, that is true, but later on. I, initially, Bank A 
is supposed to be supplying Bank C with funds. So if it's really in trouble, those funds are going to dry up. What will the effect of Bank C? Bank B, sorry, Bank A on Bank C. What will the effect be? So it doesn't affect it, there's no money. What else? At the back there, shout out for who wants? So is the people down the front. The acoustics in here are excellent, so I can hear you. Bank C might borrow from B or D, which yeah. means they won't be supporting A. So. Okay, so, so the, the first thing is, very good. So the first thing is that there's a substitution effect, right? So basically, if Bank A hasn't got much cash, Bank C starts borrowing from Bank D, okay? Or maybe Bank B. That's the first thing, okay? The second thing, we've got another. Bank C has the fun, yeah, very good, excellent. Bank C has, or exactly as a commenter just said there, Bank C has to financially help Bank A. Bank C can actually extend lines of credit to Bank A. So excellent point there, whoever made that point. It can actually go the other way. Bank C can go, well, okay, we're not going to borrow any money from you. We'll actually give you some. And that's indeed exactly what happened. This, this thing here is called the interbank market. This is called the interbank market, and it was the market that seized completely after Lehman Brothers. After the collapse of the Lehman Brothers bank, this is the market that dried up because these banks didn't trust each other. Okay? But these guys, France and Germany, have overall responsibility for monitoring their banks. They also have overall responsibility for what happens to these banks. So ch let's change the labels. This is in France. This is Greece, okay? This is a Greek bank that goes by. What happens now? What happens is, Bank A is owned by Bank C. It's a subsidiary. And in that case, when Bank A goes by, Bank C goes by. And if Bank C goes by, then bank B is going to go back. The only bank that's going to be left standing is bank D. Why? Because it's receiving a net outflow. It's just lending to them both. Yeah? So this is quite important. And it's important to understand the European crisis in this light. These connections of leverage, liquidity, solvency, and contagion. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time, folks. Have a nice week, week and weekend. Don't forget, you have to submit your, pro, uh, your book reviews tomorrow by 5 p.m. Um, 